So welcome to Be a Citizen Scientist. I hope everybody that's joining us either live or on the recording is excited about being able to contribute in some way to Portage County, to be able to document the resources that we have in the county, to be able to partner with the Park District, and to be able to really make a difference for land managers and for conservation. Now, what we're going to be doing this evening is first talk a little bit about what are some of our current initiatives at the park that citizens can get involved um, with and how to start that process. I'm also going to share with you and spend a little more time on what are some of the resources that are out there in the technological universe that are valuable for science and valuable to, for collecting data that can be used on lots of different platforms in lots of different research capacities and to really assist with organizations even outside of Portage County. So if you are somebody that likes to contribute to a larger cause while also educating yourself and being amazed by everything that nature has to offer, then I think citizen science is something that fits nicely with, uh, with your goals there. So let's start with the mission of the Park District. Our mission is to conserve Portage County's natural heritage and also to provide opportunities for its appreciation and enjoyment. We are all about connecting people to our incredible natural resources in the county. And so the citizen science really um, fits nicely into that mission because by participating in some of our citizen science programs and documenting what you're seeing and finding and identifying at our park properties, that helps us to be better managers of that, that land, that helps us to make decisions um, about how we're, where we're going to put some of our efforts. So we appreciate that and it, just know that when you participate, you are really making a difference. So first let's go over what are some of the park districts um, official programs or initiatives that are happening related to citizen science. And so the first group of those are group projects, so organized group projects. So sometimes that is invasive species removal where we're targeting specific invasives and working with our natural areas team to remove those. Other times it's things like tree planting, which on its surface doesn't seem like it would be a citizen science type program because citizen science is all about uh, folks who are collecting data, collecting scientific information that can then be used and shared in other capacities. But tree planting, whenever we do uh, planting on our property, we're also doing some monitoring associated with that. So uh, for example, at Dix Park, there's a windbreak that was planted in 2019. And so we have volunteers that assisted with that and are who are still coming back and monitoring that for survival rates and um, you know replacements, things, things like that. So group projects that are organized by the park district is one, one section. Another would be trail monitoring. So these are things that we do train specific volunteers to do, but that as a visitor to any of our park properties, you could participate in. Um, the garlic mustard pooling is one that you really need to be a volunteer to be helping out with that just so that we know when and where that's happening and that you have the right training for it. But that's a really easy activity that uh, families can do, um, that individuals can do right along the trail. So invasive species monitoring is another and specifically one of the initiatives that we're going to be starting up this spring is monitoring for the invasive uh, spotted lanternfly. Uh, which is really a tree hopper, but uh, it's it has not been found yet in Portage County, but uh, it has been found nearby. And so we have folks that are already uh, out there take, you know, looking for those. Um, if you're interested in that, then I'm going to show you how to get involved momentarily. And then finally, we have some specialized monitoring projects. Um, for this season, uh, the first one that we're going to be implementing is our pollinator monitoring. So we're taking some baseline, um, getting some baseline monitoring data at some of our newer park properties, as well as existing park properties, just to start to understand who is there, what the species diversity looks like, and we will be providing training to our volunteers that are interested in participating in that project. 
some of the future projects that um, uh, we'll be spearheading are things like Frog Watch USA, where in the spring, you know, listening and documenting which um, amphibian species we're hearing on the park properties, uh, breeding bird surveys on our park properties, stream monitoring, some various mammal projects um, are on the on the planning table right now, as well as a phenology uh, project, which is uh, basically timing um, the timing the sequence of events and observing that in nature, what bloom times, when um, and how they correlate with the emergence of different types of insects. Uh, the, the Ohio State is working on a project that uh, we're hope we hope to be able to participate in. So those are all things that if any of that sounds exciting to you, if anything on the screen here is something that you say, gosh, I would love to get involved with, well, then we want you to sign up as a park volunteer because all of those activities are things that we really need you to be official. <laughs> and so we want you to be signed up for our volunteer programs. So this is how you sign up. Uh, the picture on the screen here is of the homepage of our portageparkdistrict.org website. And there are two different ways that you can find the volunteer programs. First, right on the front page, you'll see this photo of our admin assistant, Rory. It says, get involved. You can click on that, or you can click on the drop down menu that says, get involved, and then choose volunteer programs. Both of those clicks are going to bring you to this page. This describes our volunteer programs. It also has a um, a button to complete an application. So if you want to complete your application online, that's the easiest way. Just click that button and it will be submitted to our staff and you'll be contacted to set up a time for a short orientation. We're currently doing those virtually, but we hope to be able to transition to in-person volunteer orientation soon. Um, after your orientation, then you'll be able to access our volunteer portal and be able to connect with some of those cool activities that I started the program with. If you would prefer to do paper forms, all of the uh, paper downloads are available um, below. So the volunteer programs page is where you want to sign up if you want to be involved in any of those organized initiatives with the park district. Um, and we have lots of different levels of volunteering. So if you just have a few days a year that you can spare to, to participate, then you're welcome. We have some uh, more in intensive volunteer uh, opportunities such as our trail ambassadors that are out all the time. So just know that there are lots of different ways that you can be involved and we have all different levels of participation from our volunteers and we appreciate all of them. So thank you. So I'm going to spend most of the uh, the remainder of the program talking about the different technologies that are available. And you know when I first started thinking about putting this program together, while we have a lot of these hands-on in-person um, activities that are happening, there's lots that you can do as just a visitor to, I shouldn't even say just, as a visitor and supporter of our park properties. Um, there's lots that you can do while you are there without having to be signed up as a volunteer um, and that genuinely contributes to our, uh, our work and our management plans, as well as regional, national, even global projects that are happening. So I want to go through, these are the, the different websites or apps that I'm going to be talking in a slightly more detail about as we move through the program tonight. The first is bugguide.net. For all you insect folks out there, um, this is a surprisingly um, valuable, I'll, I'll explain that later, surprisingly valuable site. Nest Watch, Feeder Watch, so this is for our bird crowd, and eBird. Those are all um, different uh, citizen science programs that are out there. Then I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on iNaturalist because this hits a very broad range of topics and is one of the more useful tools that we have for citizen science. And then finally, I was actually just introduced to the Seek app, which is um, a sister offspring app from iNaturalist. Our brand new education program specialist, outreach specialist, um, Rebecca Rohde, is, uh, she introduced me to this and I'm so excited about it. So I'm going to share that information um, with you. This is going to be especially um, 
attractive to parents or guardians of kiddos if you're concerned at all about you know, some of that social um, social apps and privacy and location then this seek app i think is going to really hit all the buttons for you all right so let's start with bug guide so bugguide.net is a really clunky website <laughs> Great intro, right? But I promise it is so useful. But when you go to it, you're, it's one of those sites that you think, gosh, is this a real, you know, is this a real site? It is. In fact, if you talk to most entomologists that are um, active in the field right now, they will reference this as a great resource for data. So a couple little tips and tricks on Bug Guide. This is not an app. This is a website, but it is neat because you start by at the clickable guide. If you're brand new, if you if you don't have a lot of knowledge about the different families and orders and um, suborders of insects, then you look at the pictures. So you look here and you say, hmm, you know, the insect that I'm trying to identify, what does it most look like here? So in this case, I went ahead and chose the, um, the happy little hemipteran, um, but it looks like the cicadas because not quite in Northeast Ohio, but in parts of Ohio in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have the 17 year cicadas, the brood 10 or brood X that's going to be emerging. So I wanna learn, maybe, maybe I found a cicada and I wanna identify it. So I click on the cicada photo and it brings up um, some pictures here. Now, none of these look like cicadas, but this does give me to get me to the order Hemiptera, which is true bugs. And so I could go ahead and click on one of the pictures that looks most like a cicada and get more information about it. Or I could just look through here and see information about um, this order, um, how, what are some of the ways to identify it. You can browse through the taxonomy of that, a whole library of images, um, links to research articles and other, um, other resources. Uh, one of my favorite ones here is uh, FRAS. So if you can, you can submit photos to Bug Guide. So if you can't find, you have a picture of an insect and you have clicked around through this clunky site and you have not been able to find uh, what you're looking for, you can request an ID and you can submit your photo. This site goes out to um, entomologists worldwide. And so they're constantly going in and commenting, um, identifying for people, correcting identification. Um, so it's, it's a very interactive site and it's used all the time and this is i have the best luck when it comes to insects at identifying them through this site now frass makes me laugh because if you're familiar with frass it's the excrement <laughs> of insects right so caterpillars um you know they're, they have really easy to see frass and of course their frass gets bigger as they get bigger um in, on bug guide the frass is for the pictures that are just not they're a little bit too blurry maybe not the right angle, nobody can identify or has been able to identify them yet. And so if that's, if your picture falls into that category, it might go into the FRAS category, which when it's there, it'll be there for 30 days. And if nobody is able to give an uh, identification on it, it'll go away and you'll have to try again. So the bug guide, if you're looking for insects and you're trying to identify insects, this is a great guide, but it's not just about identification. We're talking citizen science tonight. And this this database, once you have submitted your insect photos to Bug Guide and it's been identified by entomologists, it gets added to some of these global databases, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So you are contributing to the identification of all of these different kinds of insects. And if you're not an insect person, um, I hope that you become one <laughs> and get inspired to start looking at what's out in your yard or what's out at the parks when you're walking along because um, the insect community is really foundational to the food web. So if you love birds, then I'm going to say you should love insects too because they form the base of that food chain. So without the insects, we there's lots of other both animals, birds um, that and even other insects that wouldn't be here without them. So uh, that's bugguide.net. Remember, that's a website, not an app. The next 
group that we're going to move into is all about birds. And so we can get pretty excited about birds. And the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is one of the best resources, in my opinion, for bird identification and conservation. Um, the Audubon Society is also a great resource for that. I love the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's um, tools for identification. Remember, with citizen science, oftentimes um, we don't have to be so, if you're using these kinds of tools, you don't have to worry so much about um, your ability to identify. You need to just be able to put the information in a place where the experts have access to it and you get to learn in the process more about what it is that you have found. And at the same time, you're helping to contribute to these larger scale databases that can be used by scientists and researchers and land managers. So Project Nest Watch is run through Cornell's Lab of Ornithology. And we have this adorable little black cap chickadee right here on, on the front. And so while this is a citizen science project that involves watching nests, <laughs> um, nest boxes and nests, identifying eggs, identifying where nests are located. While it, it hits all of those um, data collection points, it also is a good resource for education. So you can learn about the birds that are laying the eggs. You can also learn how to identify their nests, how to identify their eggs. Like if you ever come up to a found a nest and you wonder, well, who made this nest? Whose eggs are these? Maybe they don't look like the uh, classic Robin, American Robin blue egg, and you just aren't sure who it is. Well, they've got a nest ID uh, tool that's on this site. They also have nest box plans and information about how to provide habitat for specific nesting birds. And so you can click on any of these birds and find um, a set of plans and information about their nesting strategy and ways that you can help them. Really cool project, easy for anybody to do in their backyard. Um, I, it, I highly recommend it. Loads of information on this site. All right. Also through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology comes Project Feeder Watch. So we've got Project Nest Watch. Now we've got Project Feeder Watch. And so you can find that at feederwatch.org. And it's the same type of uh, project, except now we're watching our bird feeders. So maybe you're someone who cannot get out to go walking around birding, but you've got a bird feeder set outside your window. Guess what? You can be a citizen scientist too. So all you do is register, count the birds that you observe at your feeder, identify them and enter your data into the website. So easy, fun and valuable resource. So what is this information used for? Well, Project Feeder Watch, just like the next app that I'm going and program that I'm going to talk about, um, are used to gauge the health of bird populations and also the movement of birds. So depending on what you see at your feeder and when you see it at your feeder um, can help scientists determine, okay, is this Norm, is this within the normal range and time of this bird? Um, as we see changes in climate, we're also seeing changes in the ranges of different species of animals. And birds are a, birds are a pr really great example of that. So um, this really helps track their movements and track their population health. But probably the most comprehensive citizen science tool that we have related to birds is eBird.org. So eBird is um, a very robust uh, app and website. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, the photos that I'm going to use are from the website. There is an eBird app that you can use on your phone as well. But the eBird app is really only useful for documenting what you're seeing. So. Um, the eBird, all of the exploration maps, um, all of the science articles, uh, all of the um, data manipulation that you can do and entry can be done through the website. So while I have the app on my phone, I'm a little bit old school. When I first got into birding and took my ornithology class, I was taught to have a, a small little notebook and pencil <laughs> and to write the, you know, write the birds down that, that I see. 
And while the app um, is handy, um, it's not as easy for me um, as just writing them down. So when I'm out in the field birding, I'll write down the date, the time, the weather conditions, um, and then I'll just make little notes about who I'm seeing where and how many of those individuals on a trip. When I get home, I can go into eBird and log into my account and I can go ahead and add my list with the location. So um, you can even find your map, find it on um, on the map so you can geolocate where you where you saw the birds that you saw. Um, and then that keeps a running list of all of your bird sightings um, and documents that. So do you need to have an eBird account to be able to explore eBird? Absolutely not. If you want to keep track and submit and and this would be the citizen science element, if you want to be able to submit uh, your observations to the the greater good then you need to have an eBird account so that you can submit those lists. However, if you're interested in exploring about what's out there then by all means just go to eBird.org and click on explore and you can look at species maps. So this is I've clicked on explore. You can explore um, states or regions or counties to find out what's being seen in your area. You could type in Portage County, Ohio, and you'll see a list of the what we call hotspots. Um, click on those and you can um, look and see what birds are being seen by whom and when. Just a little tidbit of uh, trivia about eBird. Currently, Berlin Lake Trail, one of our Portage Park District trails, has a a uh, total of 198 species that have been observed at that location. And that makes it the number one hotspot for birding in Portage County. So in April, we're gonna be having a birding event, one of our first in-person events uh, at Berlin Lake Trail. So I encourage you to check out our website and uh, come out and join us, see what all the fuss is about as the migration heats up. So you can explore regions. I love though to explore the species maps because the species maps gives you give you tons of historical data. You can look back for decades and see what time of year the American robins were spotted in a certain place or what time of year were and what locations were sandhill cranes seen. And one of my favorites are the spring warblers. This one on the screen is the magnolia warbler, which if I had to choose a spring warbler as a favorite, this would be it. I just think that beautiful, um, like black, they call it a pearl necklace, um, is so, so lovely. Uh, so this is a male magnolia warbler. Uh, the warblers are currently migrating and we are so fortunate to live in the part of Ohio that is right smack dab in the middle of their migration pattern. So come April and into May, uh, these birds just will be flocking and flying through our area before they rest on the banks of Lake Erie, before making the big, to fuel up, before making the big trip north to Canada. So if I wanna see where the Magnolia Warblers are right now, which is what I wanted to find out today, I just typed Magnolia Warbler in under the species tool. And I indicated that I wanted to know where they are in the current year, any sightings between March and May. So every person that saw and entered a Magnolia Warbler sighting is gonna show up on this map. So you can tell where they are based on the purple. So as of today, the Magnolia Warblers are as close as Jacksonville, which means they're on their way here because they do um, overwinter in Central America. So they have started to make the trip. And so we will, you'll be able to see this over the course of the next few weeks, you'll be able to see that purple start to move north uh, as the weather warms up. So really neat tool, uh, lots of different things that you can use it for. But as a citizen scientist, this is the type of data and information that is useful to scientists and others. So by entering your bird sightings into eBird, you're contributing to these maps that we're able to track and see and then document over years and years and years when and how many individuals were, were seen. You know, when were they moving? Where were they moving? Um, really, really interesting stuff and valuable information that can only be um, achieved when we've got lots of folks like you who are inputting into these, uh, these resources. So I'm going to spend um, 
quite a bit of time here on iNaturalist. And the reason is that iNaturalist has quickly become, um, it was has quickly become one of the most useful citizen science tools that we have. Now it is a social app. So it's, um, it's like a, it's a social media app for nature nerds. <laughs> for anybody that's interested in nature but it's really useful to educate and to learn so from a user end uh, using iNaturalist is going to open up a whole world of information and uh, really spark some interest in uh, different types of species um, for plants in particular uh, this is an incredibly useful um, useful app but it is a social app it connects over a million scientists and naturalists. When I started at the Park District in 2019, my coworker Bob Lang and I did a program about iNaturalist. And at that time, they only had a few, just a few short years ago, they only had 750,000 scientists and naturalists, and now they're well over a million. So this is growing exponentially, which is great for research and data collection because the way iNaturalist works is that when you, the user, enter in a photo to iNaturalist for identification, maybe you think you know what it is, and so you go ahead and you put the, the ID in there. And let's say it's a, uh, an insect. It's one of our, let's say it's one of our uh, solitary bees, native bees. And I think that it's this particular bee, and I go ahead and I label it as such. Well, there are bee experts that are around the country that have their settings set so that they, when a bee in Portage County shows up or in Ohio shows up, they get a notification of it. So they can then go in and identify, hmm, is, is, that, is that correct or is that an incorrect identification? Or maybe I just knew it was a bumblebee, but I didn't know what species it was. Then maybe they will be able to use what I entered to identify it down to species. And so there's, um, there's a, a give and take that happens on iNaturalist to confirm the quality of the data. So when, and we'll talk about how this works, but once it's considered a research grade identification in iNaturalist, then it's added to GBIF. And if you're not familiar with GBIF, I put the uh, website on there because it is such a cool, if you're a data, consumer. <laughs> it is so interesting. GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And it is a, I'm going to say a clearinghouse of natural resource data that is, is open. It's open to be, to be acquired and used. So imagine the impact that that can make on regional and statewide and national projects when you've got lots of information that's being entered in there, research grade information that can then be used for um, to direct studies, to support or um, uh, contest research, to, I mean, really, really fascinating um, bits of info to help with taxonomy changes. I mean, it's really interesting. So research quality data from iNaturalist goes to GBIF um, and is shared with them, which it can then be shared um, to lots of other organizations and individuals. And like I mentioned earlier, iNaturalist is a great educational tool. You'll learn from experts about all different organisms um, in your area. And as your knowledge grows, then you'll become better and better at being able to identify some of the organisms that you're finding and entering into iNaturalist. So there is iNaturalist.org, that is the website, but it's the flip side version of, of eBird. So remember I said with eBird, um, the website is like where you're going to get, it's the most user-friendly and um, you know information loaded. <laughs> Um, website, but the app is really just a tool to be able to enter and speak to the website. For iNaturalist, you want to download the app on your phone if you want to participate in I, iNaturalist. Um, yes, you can totally do it on, on the desktop version, but I personally, so I guess this is just my personal opinion, but I think the app is really well done and it's easy to use and it gets all that information inputted while you're in the field. Something that sets iNaturalist um, apart from something like eBird is that you are using it both 
to document what you find and also to to search and figure out what it is that you found. So it's for documentation and identification. And iNaturalist should only be used for wild organisms, okay? Um, I have these crazy trees up here for a reason. I just wanted to give a quick little reminder about what exactly an organism is. So everything on this tree of life here is an organism. And of course, they're grouped into different um, different categories. So in iNaturalist, there's plants, there are fish, reptiles, mammals, birds, amphibians, mollusks, arachnids, insects, and fungus. There's even a little other category. <laughs> so any of these organisms can be inputted into iNaturalist with a picture. So you need to have the photo. So yes, birds are on here. And yes, you're gonna find some birds that are loaded into iNaturalist. But if you are wanting to contribute to the data set for birds, I recommend using eBird because that gives, it's a more complete data set. Um, it's more useful to the ornithology world. And iNaturalist is, and it's hard to get pictures of birds. Let's, I mean, on your cell phone, <laughs> through the app, it's a little bit tough. So. Uh, not always the easiest, um, it, it, it not as, there's not as much, of, not as large of a database to work with um, for birds. So I do recommend eBird if you're doing birds. For anything else, um, you can use iNaturalist. And so what it does is it goes from just a beetle to just like the tree, we're going to go, you know, we've got the great grandparents, our grandparents, the parents, and we start to branch off. The same thing happens with these different organisms. So the larger group would be the beetles. Then we have the lady beetles. Um, of the lady beetles, we go down into genus and then we go down into species. The spotted cucumber beetle is still a beetle. It's just not a lady beetle. So it's in its different, a different category. So iNaturalist helps you to narrow down um, to you know, from family, you know, down to genus or species. And they want you to do, for iNaturalist, the goal is to make observations of organisms. So what is an observation? An observation is what you saw, what was choosing, um, what, where, what you saw, when you saw it, where you saw it, and including any evidence like photos or even sound. So once those are entered in and you literally just take a photograph of the organism that you're observing and it will give some suggestions for identification. But once you have it entered in there, then it gets uh, reviewed by experts that are on iNaturalist. So just like with um, eBird, um, just like with Bug Guide, you have specialists that um, and curators that are on iNaturalist that will go through and uh, are interested in seeing all of maybe all the uh, lichens or all of the uh, all of the beetles that are entered in or all of the bumblebees that are entered in. And they will go in and they'll see when those are added in particular areas and then they can confirm the identification of that. Did this person who entered it in, the citizen scientist, did they get the ID right? Yes or no? And it's really a con it's a conversation. So you record your observations. It gets shared with fellow naturalists and experts in the field. Then there's sometimes some debate about what exactly it is. But once it gets three identification confirmations from experts, then it's considered research grade. That's what this RG stands for, research grade. And once it's research grade, and only once it's research grade, does it go to the GBIF database and is it looked at um, for, for research projects. The community of iNaturalist is what maintains that data integrity. It's that re records, sharing, discussion, confirmation. Great news if you want to help the Portage Park District out. You don't have to choose a project. There are things um, we could spend a whole class on teaching about iNaturalist, but there are different projects and surveys that you can I, you can choose to have your photo included in. Um, the way that we have set up the Portage Park District's iNaturalist um, account is that we have our Portage Park District survey includes all of our park properties, which means any photo that's entered 
uh, that's taken and entered into iNaturalist automatically gets added to our survey, which means our natural area staff automatically knows when, where, and what it was that was, um, was, was photographed, which is great because that means you are helping to document these species of all these different life forms that are located in our parks. So please, Use iNaturalist while you're at the park so that we can collect more data about what are the plant and animal species that are living there. Now I wanna transition to the Seek app, which is new to me, but I'm really excited about it. So the Seek app is actually produced by iNaturalist. One of the concerns for parents and um, for younger users is the safety and security of location and identity when it comes to documenting organisms on iNaturalist. But yet, how there's so much information that we can learn from on iNaturalist. So what did iNaturalist do? They went ahead and made an app that uses the iNaturalist data. So all of that research grade information, all those research grade photos that are on iNaturalist, that database is what Seek uses to identify what's out in the field. So you do have the option, I'm gonna talk about this in a moment, you do have the option of logging in with an iNaturalist account, but you don't have to. Seek does not uh, use GPS, any location services. It is not connected to the internet. It is an, an app that pulls from and uses a database that's uh, through iNaturalist. So one fun thing about um, about Seek is that you have challenges and you can earn badges for all different species. So observing a certain number of amphibians or observing a certain number of beetles can help you earn badges. There are even citizen science challenges that are in the Seek app. Um, there's also seasonal challenges, location challenges, really fun, fun stuff. So you can make it a little bit of a game. Uh, and again, it it works with iNaturalist. You take a photo, you actually just open up the app and it automatically brings up the photo. You uh, put that on the, the organism that you're trying to identify and it will automatically try and identify that. Whoopsies, oh my. There we go. Um, if it can't identify the, the organism that you take the photo of, then it will um, give you the option of submitting that to iNaturalist. So just for parents out there, um, one of the, the cool things about this is that you have the choice. So if you already have an iNaturalist account, you can go ahead and submit that unknown organism to iNaturalist. So that way it helps to build that database and Maybe you can get an identification on it, but if you just don't feel comfortable doing that, you don't have to. Um, there's there's no requirement to to submit that. Kids that are 13 or that are under 13 need to get a parent's parent's permission before um, before uh, logging into iNaturalist. Over 13, they can go ahead and have their own iNaturalist account. So a really neat tool. I am excited personally to use this more um, and to see how it'll work with the kiddos in, in my life. So does anybody have any questions for me as we wrap up? I really hope that you've enjoyed learning about some of these tools that are out there to be um, a really contribute to the science community as a citizen scientist. I also hope that you'll consider signing up to be a volunteer with the Portage Park District so you can directly participate in some of our initiatives, um, but we still welcome your input via some of the technology like eBird and iNaturalist. So thank you so much for your time tonight.